Thank you. Thank you for that nice welcome. And good morning. morning. What a fantastic day. Today I walked uh, from home to work this morning, and I walked into my office, and then I walked from my office over to this beautiful theater today, and I was again marveled by how beautiful our campus is. Our landscapers and our groundskeepers do such a fantastic job. As far as I'm, yeah. So thank you all for coming today, this morning. Thank you all in Idaho Falls and in Twin Falls and Meridian for uh, joining us online. Uh, I want to take a few minutes and talk this morning, talk about what I see for the future of the university. But before I do, I have to take one small point of personal privilege if I can. And I have two special guests in the audience today that I'd like to introduce, uh, two very special people to me. Today, joining me here in the audience, my wife, Margaret, and my daughter, Kate. Well, later this week, uh, when our students arrive, and next week when they start classes, this beautiful campus that I already talked about is going to be here to greet them. And when our students arrive, it will remind us all of why we are here. Our why. What is our why as an institution? Well, for me, our why as an institution is deeply rooted in our nation. Going back to the time to the foundation of this country, when he was asked what our nation was going to be, Benjamin Franklin often told people, a republic if you can keep it. And according to history, he often talked to crowds and he would point at the crowd as he said that, we've brought you a republic if you can keep it. Now that, coupled with another clause, just a simple phrase, not even a full sentence, sums up this point that is fundamental to our democracy. It's so fundamental, in fact, that the phrase is included in the constitution of many of the states. It's in Idaho's Constitution. Article 9, Section 1 of Idaho's Constitution says, the stability of the republic as a form of government depends mainly upon the intelligence of the people. The stability of the republic depends mainly upon the intelligence of the people. We have brought you a republic if you can keep it. What that means is that our self-governance as a people, as envisioned by a republic, this concept of government of the people, by the people, and for the people only works when the people are intelligent enough to make their decisions. In other words, when the people are educated enough to make their self-governance decisions. When people go to the polling box to vote for their representatives, when they go to vote for a school board or a school bond, or a citizen initiative or referendum, the people must be educated to self-govern as our republic intended. In order for our society to continue as we understand it, the people must be educated. Also, education is critical for our society to get better. Changes in society, social changes in society to make our society better are always accompanied with more education. For us as a society to discard things that were once considered acceptable and say those are no longer acceptable, our society can be better than that. That our society can get better and evolve and move forward requires education. Education provides for people's livelihoods. Education makes our society better. Education is the basis for the continuation of the republic. And ultimately, at the end of the day, education improves people's lives. Education improves people's lives. That's why we are here. That's why we do what we do. So, okay, this is the part of the speech where you all say, okay, thanks, Kevin, great story. (laughs) 
appreciate you telling us all that and all, but uh, we have some real challenges here at Idaho State. We have some things we need to work on to make ourselves better. We're kind of resource challenged here, Kev. Um, (laughs) So we need more people and resources to get this done. So my answer to that is this. As you get to know me better, you'll realize I like to tell stories. And I also like to learn things from history. And sometimes I like to take stories from history and see that they could be analogous to our situation. So lucky for you, (laughs) I have the stage. (laughs) So you get to hear one of my stories. And it goes like this. In the year 400 BC, In the year 400 BC, 10,000 Greek soldiers went into Persia to fight on one side of a Persian civil war. Now they fought on the side of Cyrus the Younger, and Cyrus was fighting and battling for the throne against his older brother. And the Greeks fought on his side during the civil war at the Battle of Cunaxa. Now the Greeks, being the best soldiers in the world at the time, won the battle pretty decisively, but unfortunately for them, as it turns out, during the battle, Cyrus was killed. So the remaining Persians on both sides of the battle came together, they reconciled, they reunited under one king, the other guy. And the other guy was not happy to have this foreign army in his country. So these 10,000 Greeks found themselves now trapped behind enemy lines a thousand miles from home on foot. A thousand miles from home on foot is a two year march. And these Greeks found themselves behind enemy lines, a long way from safety. They didn't have enough people. They didn't have enough supplies. They didn't have enough resources. They didn't have enough money. And they were facing a long journey home, and no one thought they were going to be successful. Everyone thought, they're not going to survive, let alone succeed. Everything, all the odds were against them. One of their leaders was a man named Xenophon. And Xenophon called together the officers and then called together all the Greeks And he talked to them about these impossible odds that they faced. And this is what he said to them. He said, let us not wait for others to call upon us to do great deeds. Let us instead be the first to summon others to our path. Show yourselves to be the bravest. And as for me, if you are willing to take initiative like this, then I will follow you. Every one of you is a leader. He rallied the troops around him, and they started their march home, the journey of the 10,000. Now, two years later, against all odds, they made it home. In 399 BC, they made it back to safety in Greece. So, question is, does this story sound familiar to any of you? Let Let me recap the story. A small group in an isolated place. They're surrounded by other groups that don't have their best interests at heart. (laughs) They don't have enough people. They don't have enough resources. They don't have enough equipment. They don't have enough supplies. They don't have enough money. And all the odds seem against them. Everybody seems out to get them. And at times, they even start to doubt themselves whether they will be successful. When I put it that way, does the story sound familiar? Well, if it does, here's my message to you. Let us not wait for other people to call on us to do great deeds. Let us instead be the first to summon others to our path at Idaho State University. And as for me, if you are all ready to take initiative like this, then I will follow you. Every one of you can be a leader at Idaho State University moving towards our future. We're going to be moving towards a future that is well-rooted in our past. We have some great successes in our past, and we need to make sure we celebrate those. So lest we forget, let's look at some of those now. At 
the turn of the 19th century, the world was changing and the communities in Southeast Idaho rallied behind a cause that would allow them to evolve with the times, education. In 1901, the Academy of Idaho was formed. It's here where our story begins. Soon after, in the shadow of Red Hill on a small plot of land, four teachers and 40 students met in Swanson Hall, each with the desire to learn. Without knowing it, they began a tradition of community, academic excellence, and inclusion that has persevered through political opposition, the Great Depression, two world wars, crippling drought, five name changes, and even the Spanish flu. It's not enough just to survive, to weather the storms. They set out to flourish, to innovate, and to be the architect of a better day tomorrow. We built the first covered football stadium on a college campus. In 1941, we made national headlines as pioneers in live television broadcasting. We were among the first co-ed universities to have a female student body president, and in 1951, the only one in the nation. We are national champions in football, boxing, and debate. Benny the Bengal was the national champion of mascots. From the first 40 to more than 12,000 today, Idaho State University works with students to have their education fit their life. Even as far back as 1905, we began offering night classes, an idea that was new in academics. Following World War II, 90% of our students were returning veterans. We were Idaho's first business college and have built a legacy in programs in North America and worldwide. Music, dance, and theater celebrate the arts in a premier facility, a gem in the gem state, the Stevens Performing Arts Center. We are the health science leader in Idaho, and our outpatient clinics serve more than 50,000 Idahoans. We are a leader in energy, serving as one of only a handful of colleges in the world with an operating nuclear reactor, and no other university has more operational accelerators in North America. Our graduates are Olympic gold medalists, CEOs of multinational corporations, award-winning actors, best-selling authors, world-renowned researchers, and elected officials at all levels of government. Our faculty are experts in their fields, not just educators, but mentors changing our students' lives, empowering them with knowledge and hands-on experience. So when they go out into the world, they work to build a better one. We have built upon our foundation of vocational training to become a research university that provides incredible opportunities to anyone who seeks to improve their lives. This is our legacy. What we have built through generations of hard work and determination as an institution and as a community. Take pride in calling yourself a bangle. Bleed orange and black. We've endured. We've prospered. In 1901, our story began. Today, we write the next chapter. Yep, that's who we are. We have a fantastic history and legacy to build from. And that legacy starts with our faculty. And we need a future where we continue to do great things. And one of the primary ways we continue that legacy is to continue to add to our outstanding faculty. I want to take a few moments and welcome our newest faculty to help us they come to us from some of the finest universities from around the nation, and they're going to help us continue to accomplish our mission. When I arrived, I know that the faculty will find exactly what happened when I arrived. They are going to find a staff of employees who are here to greet them and welcome them to the university. Our staff has been so overwhelmingly welcoming and friendly. I've genuinely, my family and I have been overwhelmed by it. To all of our staff th at this university, thank you for the welcome I have received and for the one I'm sure our new faculty 
the newest part of our legacy, the re reception that they will receive as well. To help us further accomplish our mission, I want to talk to you today about another concept, one that is very important to me, and I hope it becomes important to all of you. There is abundant research that everyone needs from their manager, from their supervisor, from their organization, four basic things. Every employee needs to feel these four basic things, and they are trust, compassion, stability, and hope. Research shows that if you want an organization where your employees thrive, where innovation can flourish, where productivity, positivity, and job satisfaction all intersect, then you have to provide an environment where trust, compassion, stability, and hope all exist, and that everyone feels that they exist. Now, you may or may not have these now in your departments, in your part of the university. You may or may not, but I believe that we can have an organization where these are prevalent everywhere in all that we do, in all that we build, as a foundation for what we stand for, that our core values will be built upon trust, compassion, stability, and hope. Now, I've been on campus for eight weeks, exactly, 56 days today. <laughs> and I promise to come here and listen and learn, and I have, and I will continue to do that. But I acknowledge that in that short time, I've just scratched the surface of what I need to know. There's many of you I haven't met yet, and much I need to understand about our culture and how we are going to get things done. And just one part of that listening program I want to announce is I'm going to be starting a program called Coffee with Kevin, which is good that it has that name because it's mine too. We should have called it Coffee with Keith and then see, see what happened. <laughs> but it's Coffee with Kevin. And so I'm going to be in a room in the student union once a month, and I'm going to have coffee or, in case of me, my favorite is hot chocolate. So we'll have coffee and hot chocolate with Kevin. But we'll have that, and I'm going to be there in the room, and if you have something you want to talk about, show up. Come talk to me. Tell me what's on your mind so we can talk through what we need to do as an institution. Another program that I want to roll out is the One Thing Campaign. The One Thing Campaign. Think about the one thing that you think that if we did it, it would make Idaho State University better. What one thing, what one idea do you think you'd like to let me know so that we can consider it? Well, the details for the One Thing campaign and for Coffee with Kevin are both on the website at the president's office. Please go to that website, send me your one thing idea, and plan to stop by sometime and have coffee. Now, speaking of one thing, there's one thing that I noticed when I arrived. One thing I noticed when I got here is that our university does not currently have an approved master plan. Now, a master plan was created several years ago through the efforts of many people, but that plan was never formally approved and was never presented for adoption to our statewide governing board. So I am calling on all of us to work together to immediately begin a master planning effort for the development of all of our campuses here in Pocatello and in Idaho Falls and in Twin Falls and in Meridian it is time for us to have a plan for a future physical plant that is driven by our academic needs and the needs of our students. A campus-wide input program will be put in place and we will produce a plan that shows we are ready to invest in our own future. A plan that the entire campus, our constituents and our community and our donors can be inspired by. A plan that shows to our patrons we are preparing for our future a plan that inspires. Which, <laughs> 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 
which leads me to another story. So it's a story about fundraising. So there was a, a very prestigious university um, that was doing a fundraising campaign. And they reached out to one of their absolutely wealthiest alumni. And they went to her and they said, hey, we're finishing out our capital campaign and we could really use one last big gift to put us over the top. We need a gift of $25 million to put us over the top of this campaign. <laughs> and, you know, we could really use that money. We need it. And this wealthiest of donors who had the money, by the way, said, no, turned them down. About six months later, it was in the news that that same donor gave $50 million to a different university to put a new wing on a hospital. Well, the first university went back to her and said, so you're one of our alumni, and we asked you for $25 million to help us out, and you said no, and then you gave double that, $50 million to this other university. Why, why'd that happen? She looked at them and she said, you asked me for $25 million to help you in a capital campaign. They asked me for $50 million to help cure cancer. That concept, the concept of that story, holds true, just as true, for our donors as it does for the State Board of Education, as it does for the legislature, as it does for our community and our students. We have to tell our compelling story. They all know we need the money. Every one of those groups knows we need the money, but they're not going to give it to us just because we need it or just because they like us. We have to tell our compelling story of why we need the money and what we will do with it. Articulating our story is critical to our future. Not our needs, as justifiable as our needs are, we have to tell our story. Who are we? Why do we do what we do, and how do we do it so well? We need to let people know why they need to invest in us. In short, we need to work on our brand. So, I have asked our Marketing and Communications Department to, with all dispatch, develop a new marketing and brand image campaign to start telling the world our story. Our market position, our image, our value to the community and to the state all depends on us being able to articulate our story, our why. And one of the things that I have found in my listening so far that is a foundation to our story is how well our faculty treat our students. I've heard from all over. I've heard from many of you here in the room. I've heard from our community. I've heard directly from students how much our faculty care and how much they pay attention to our students. That student-centric culture is critical for us. I've heard people talk about Idaho State University as big university opportunities with a small school experience. I've heard them describe us as private college level of individualized attention, but at a public university price. That's what our faculty do every day. That distinguishes us. And please, let me thank the faculty for doing that. And speaking directly to our faculty, I am asking at your earliest opportunity to work with me on the development of a faculty constitution, one that meets the spirit of shared governance. It needs to meet the spirit of shared governance and provide a framework where we can work together to move the university forward. I am ready to work side by side with you to get this done. More importantly, I want to get this done. I want to work with you. I know about the past struggles. We're not going to fix them overnight. But I know that you are the ones as faculty who are on the ground every day delivering that core mission of education, 
So I want to make sure the university makes all of its decisions with that in mind, with you in mind. I believe in that collaboration. I need that collaboration and discussion because that's going to improve the institution and help us prosper. I need to be able to work with you. So, sorry, I'm going to pause for a minute and go off script. I know I shouldn't do it. Um, <laughs> in my experience, I've learned one of the basic lessons of leadership, um, which is, as a leader, every decision you make will be criticized by someone. Um, and it's not some of your decisions, and it's not some of the time. As a leader, every decision you make will be criticized by someone. So I know that what I'm about to say is going to draw criticism. But I also know that when something is the right thing to do, you need to do it. So I'm going to say it. You've been through a lot. As a university, you've been through a lot the last few years. Uh, I can only imagine how hard it has been for you. Please let me say, I'm sorry you went through that. But also let me say something else. Thank you. Everyone, everyone here, to a person, thank you for being here today. You're here because you believe in what we do and why we do it. And I think you're ready to move forward. I think you want to move forward. You want to make things better. Well, if you are ready to move forward and make things better, that's why I'm here too. We can do it together. So, back to where I was. Um, so, in the last couple of weeks, um, I've been visiting with local and regional employers. I went to On Semiconductor, I went to the FBI, I've met with business leaders. We've been discussing how Idaho State University can work collaboratively with those companies and those employers. Now, as you all probably know, On Semiconductor is one of the largest employers in Pocatello. It's part of a global network of over 34,000 employees in that company. And the plans out at the FBI for their expansion are pretty ambitious. So we talked about how we can help them. And here's what I learned. Here's one thing that I learned. At On Semiconductor, they told me, they showed me their employee demographics for the company. And they told me that over the next five to 10 years, based on their retirements and the age demographics of their workforce, they are going to have a 50% turnover there. In the next few years, assuming no growth, I'm not talking about new jobs, in their existing employees in the next few years, they are going to turn over over half of their workforce in the next few years. Every one of those new employees at On Semiconductor should be an ISU graduate. Every new hire considered at the FBI should be an ISU graduate. So to do that, we're going to know what they need. And if there are certain areas where our education isn't meeting their needs, we need to know it. We need to find that out and work with our constituents to find out what they do need. We want to help employers want and desire to hire our graduates. To do that, it's going to require some improvements. We have to reach out to employers, to business, to industry, to government, to nonprofits, to any market force out there from whom our graduates will be seeking gainful and meaningful employment, and we need to know what they need. And once we do, we need to take that into account as we graduate our students. We owe that to our students. Given the price they are paying, we have a duty to look our students in the eye and look their parents in the eye and tell them, 
We are going to help these students become more employable upon graduation. To do all of this, we have to work internally. We have to work on what we do in lots of areas. Now, one of the first major initiatives I'd like to announce today is that today I'm announcing the start of a nationwide search for a vice president of finance and business affairs. In the coming days, I'm going to take... In the coming days, I'm going to take input from the entire campus community on the structure of our finance operation, and we will be forming a committee to help with the search for that position. I think we all share a philosophy, a philosophy that must, must drive our business operations going forward, and that is this. Our budget must be driven by our mission. Our mission is not to meet the budget. <laughs> our goals must drive our business processes. Our goal is not to meet the business processes. Now, in furtherance of that philosophy, I have a couple of items I'd like to announce. Now, I know, I promised. I promised I was going to come and learn and listen before I took actions, that I wanted to be collaborative and make sure we have a shared vision going forward, and all that is true. But as you get to know me, you'll also realize I like to solve problems. Challenges are okay for me. I like to get in and, and work on them. And there are a few things that I've already done, and I hope that those will be well received and in furtherance of that shared mission. So first, I'd like to announce that I have asked that the FAC codes be removed from our long distance calling system. <laughs> it sounds like maybe some of you have heard of those. <laughs> Well, everybody knows the FAC code is the six-digit code you have to enter to get an outside long-distance line. For those of you who only know it by its acronym, FAC, it stands for Forced Access Code. <laughs> well, just the first word alone is enough for me. <laughs> forced. What the FAC is... <laughs> Didn't even really plan that one. Uh, <laughs> to me, <laughs> it represents an administrative hang-up that slows down our accomplishing of the mis mission. It sends a mission, it sends a message that the goal of the organization comes second to the billing. Now, for example, Let's say our goal is to reach out to a student from Twin Falls. The long distance nature of the call is not more important than recruiting the student. <laughs> but requiring the code first, before the call sends a message that we're more worried about the phone bill than the student recruitment. Well, that philosophy is ending. I do not want any person on this campus to hesitate to reach out and call a student or their family of a student because they are worried about a chargeback coming through to their departmental budget. Mission comes first. Now I realize the change to the fact code is a small item but it is one small symbol of the philosophy we all need to adopt, that the good of the mission, the good of the university as a whole is more important than any individual department. I know you are all strapped and everyone's trying to get their job done, but we need to make sure that every department operating 
is, is for operating for the good of the university as a whole, and administrative hangups that detract us from that mission need to be changed. Second thing, you may have noticed survey stakes going up on Red Hill. The restoration of the eye is important. I will not forget who we are, and the eye represents who we are. Again, this may be minor, but take it as a symbol of the future, about honoring our past great deeds and planning for even greater ones in the future. It's about building on what we are to see what we can become. Third, Third, I have asked the Dean's Council to immediately begin new efforts to boost our enrollments. Changes are being discussed right now that over time are designed to increase our enrollments. And fourth, somewhere in our recent past, a decision was made that after students paid their full tuition and fees, students were charged an extra voluntary fee for access to the campus Wi-Fi system. Our students, our current students we are trying to recruit are growing up knowing that Wi-Fi is ubiquitous, right? They can get free Wi-Fi in every Starbucks. They can get free Wi-Fi in sole proprietor coffee shops like Mocha Madness down the street. They can get free Wi-Fi at McDonald's. They can get free Wi-Fi in city parks someplace in open areas. But our decision to charge students extra for access to the campus Wi-Fi did not have students in mind. We can do better. So starting next week, all enrolled students will have access to the campus Wi-Fi system. Students come first. To be clear. <laughs> to be clear, on a larger scale and maybe even on a more fundamental scale, what I am saying to everyone, every part of the campus, academic, administrative, service area, to the entire university, I'm going to challenge all of you to ensure that our core mission is everyone's individual mission. To be more direct, if you are feeling like the past practices are not what you want, if you want a future where we're doing better, where we are improving and where we are innovating, then I am here to do just that. Finally, to be blunt, business as usual is not okay. It is time. <laughs> It is time for change at Idaho State University. Now, this is not a campaign speech. <laughs> I'm not running for office anywhere. I'm here to be candid with all of you. And let's be really candid. I can only promise you three things. First, I genuinely believe we can have a university built on trust, compassion, stability, and hope. Trust. Trust that we are mission-driven. Trust that we, in each and every office and department, are operating with the doctrine of mutual accountability. Meaning, each office has to get its job done, but they are also accountable to every other part of the university to help them get their job done. Trust. Trust that doing your job means helping other areas of the university fulfill our overall mission. Compassion. Compassion that we believe in shared values that start with a concept of treating people right. That we demonstrate empathy for the needs of our students and for the needs of our colleagues. That our university leadership, starting with me, 
that our university leadership cares for our employees and genuinely appreciates what you do. Stability, that we are creating a mission-driven budget, one that is stable, solid, and is preparing us for a future, that our physical plant is going to meet our academic needs, that we have the right programs and the right offerings to provide a stable, comprehensive research and teaching institution that we are all proud to serve. And hope. Hope that with a solid mission, st stabilized enrollments, and an articulated why, an articulated story, that we will secure a future of innovation, of thought leadership, and of community leadership that is worthy of Idaho State University. That's my first promise. My second promise. I will give this position my all. I will be here. I will show up. I'm ready. I am ready, willing, and able to do what we need to do to chart the future that we can all believe in, that shared vision of the future. I will promise you, I will work for that. And my, my third promise, my third promise. I'm only 56 days into this, remember. I'm going to make mistakes. There's going to be a time when I stumble. And when I do, I will admit it to you. And when I do make those mistakes, after I admit it, I will do my best to correct it. And then I will learn from it. And then the very next day, we will continue working together toward that shared vision of what we can be. A shared vision that is built on the fantastic things that we're already doing right now. We have to know these great things that we're doing right now that we can build on. There are over 3,000 four-year universities in the United States right now. We're one of them. But we are also one of only 334 universities in the entire country that are Carnegie Research Institutions. We're one of them. <laughs> this fall, this fall, we will be one of only 185 universities in the entire country that has a medical school. Because starting this fall, Starting this fall, a medical school opens on our campus, Idaho State University campus in Meridian. We'll be one of only 185. In Idaho Falls, in Idaho Falls, we share facilities with one of only 17 national research laboratories in the country. The entire United States has only 17 national labs, and we share facilities with one of them. Our School of the Performing Arts performs its programs in the number four rank university performing arts center in the country. We offer over 250 academic program choices for our students, more than any other university in the state of Idaho. We offer CTE programming, we offer associates, bachelors, certificates, masters, doctoral and postdoctoral work on a scope that no one else in the state of Idaho offers. We offer our students more choices than anybody else can. There is no reason in the world we cannot be the university of choice in our region. We build on our strengths. We will become the university of choice in our region.
And there are people out there who are going to doubt we can do it. And there are going to be people out there who say the odds are stacked against you. And there are people who are going to say you don't have enough resources and you don't have enough people and you're not going to be able to succeed. And to every one of them, I tell them this. Let us not wait for other people to call on us to do great deeds. Let us instead be the first to summon others to our path at Idaho State University. And as for me, if you are willing to take initiative like this, I am prepared to follow you. Every one of you can be the leader of our future at Idaho State University. So thank you for coming to my first fall address. And thank you. I hope you all enjoy and enjoy and join us for lunch out on the quad as a small token of appreciation and thanks for all that you do every day to make this a fantastic university. And remember, it is time for this state to hear this bangle roar. Roar, bangles, roar.